Dave and his son Sam were having lunch at the Maple Leaf Cafe in Big Narrows, Dave's hometown. It was a Saturday, early May. Dave and Sam were in town for the weekend to help Margaret with things, their spring ritual, take down the windows, turn the garden. Saturday lunch at the Maple Leaf was part of it, club sandwiches and fries, vanilla milkshakes. Last time, said Sam, we had grilled cheese. We did, said Dave. I don't remember that. Barbara brought them their shakes, two tall glasses and an aluminum container with the overflow. She set the overflow down in front of Sam. A real shake, said Dave to Sam, made with real ice cream. Sam rolled his eyes and bent his straw down. It's good, he said. And then he said, tell me another story about him. Dave said, I don't know, he was a good guy. It's a hard question. You live your life in minutes and hours. You move along beside the people you love. And in the midst of all of the moments, in the middle of all the movement, you don't often stop to commit things to memory. You never imagine there's anything about anything that's going to be of any historical importance. That someone's going to come along one day and quiz you about things. But he was my grandfather, said Sam, and I don't know anything about him. I know, said Dave, I know. He put his sandwich down. He, he liked to play the bass, he said. His friends would come over to the house on Sunday nights and they'd play music. I know that stuff, said Sam. He was slow. <laughs> he wasn't slow, said Dave. He'd fall behind the beat. <laughs> Dave was twisting around in the booth. The lady behind the counter, Barbara, held up a bottle of ketchup. Dave nodded. Thanks, he said. And then he turned back to Sam. Did I ever tell you the one where we jumped off the bridge into the river on our way home from church? I was afraid to jump, and all the other kids jumped all the time, and my dad wanted to show me I, I shouldn't be afraid, so he jumped with me. In your clothes, said Sam. <laughs> Holding hands, said Dave, in our Sunday best. He, he got in trouble for that. <laughs> Dave glanced at his son. You, you knew that one. Yup, said Sam, and he dipped one of his fries into the ramekin of ketchup the lady had brought. And he ate it and picked up another and hesitated, and then he looked at his father and said, How did he die? Heart, said Dave, he smoked. Did it hurt? I don't know, said Dave, I hope not. Sam said, Did I ever meet him? And Dave said, He died just before you were born. He would have liked you a lot. They finished lunch and they walked along to the end of River Street and then they took the shortcut along the old railroad tracks up to the high street. And they had just passed that little creek that runs beside the tracks there when Dave said, did I ever tell you the story about the fish head? That's a good story. Sam shook his head. Okay, said Dave, this is a good one. I'd forgotten all about this one. And they still had a long way to go. So Dave told it slow, like a movie. It began like a movie anyway, like a movie about spies at night, and it rained so misty it was as much fog as rain. It was around midnight in the sneaky month of April, two shadowy figures scrambling along a riverbank with miners' lamps strapped to their foreheads, the light from the lamps bouncing off the river and the balsam trees and the wet rocks along the river's edge. Here and there they step over patches of granular corn-like snow, but mostly the snow is gone from the path. Though there's still plenty in the woods under the trees where the land is low and bedded soft with pine needles. The person in front, the one with the peak hat and the oiled canvas jacket, is carrying two nets. The nets are on long poles like butterfly nets, but more substantial, made for sturdier things than butterflies. The second person, the one following, is a boy. He's carrying a rucksack on his back, and in the rucksack he has a cheese sandwich, two pieces of black licorice, and a homemade slingshot. <laughs> That's me, said Dave. The man stops and reaches into his pocket and pulls out a pack of Export A. He shakes a cigarette loose and lights it, and when the match is out, he puts it in his pocket beside a Mickey of whiskey. That's my dad. 
your grandfather were going smelting. It was the April that Dave was 11 years old. The smelt were running, and everyone knows that the best time to net smelt is in the middle of the night when the water is ice cold and you can use a flashlight to spot the fish in their silvery clouds. That was a great winter, said Dave. And it was the first spring he went smelting like that in the middle of the night with his dad. The perfect end to a perfect winter. The night they caught the famous king cod. Sam said, how did you catch it? Dave reached out and picked up a pebble and threw it into the woods. I'm not sure, he said. Sam picked up a pebble and threw it too. Dave said, we were never able to explain how we got it. It really didn't make any sense at all. Neither of them were sure, except to say that they had parked the truck at Kerrigan's about 11.30 that night and walked down the river past Big Falls, and they had stopped and talked to Mr. McCauley, who was fishing at the bend near where the logging road crossed. And they'd gone maybe a quarter of a mile further to where the river narrows by the big rocks And they'd netted up a good feed of smelt, and just before they left, Charlie somehow ended up with that big Greenland cod in his net. You see them from time to time in the lake, but no one had heard about one in the river before, but that's where they got it. It wasn't until the next morning that we saw the skull was deformed, said Dave. He and Charlie were in the shed cleaning the smelt when they spotted it. The dog watching them hopefully from the corner Fish guts all over the table. Charlie ran his knife over the bump on the fish's head. He said, looks like a crown. See, that's why they call him a king cod. Happens from time to time. Dave said, what are you going to do with it? Charlie said, we're going to eat it. Dave meant the head. Charlie said, well, we'll give the head to the dog. At the word dog, Dave's dog, Scout, looked up and cocked his head, hopefully. When they finished... Charlie gave Dave the gut bucket and told him to empty it behind the shed. But once he got back there, back where no one could see him, Dave took the king cod head and fetched an old newspaper and wrapped it up. Before he went in for dinner, he took it to the old ice house, unwrapped it, and buried it in a barrel of pickling salt. (laughs) You still had an ice house, said Sam? For sentimental reasons, said Dave. We, We had a fridge, too. Why did you keep it, said Sam? The ice house, said Dave. (laughs) The fish head, said Sam. I don't know, said Dave. It's hard to remember things like that. He he probably didn't even know back then. Dave shrugged. "Uh, I guess I figured having a fish head could come in handy. (laughs) Whatever the reason, it was important at the time, and he would check on that fish head every couple of days. He'd shimmy over the cool, damp sawdust and reach down into the salt barrel and pull out the gut-stained newspaper, the cloudy black eyes, the silver skin, the head which was drying out in the salt and becoming mummified. (laughs) He couldn't stop looking at it. It was there for a month before he told anyone. Who did you tell? Billy Mitchell. Do I know him? No, you don't know him. It was a Saturday morning. Billy and Dave had pooled their money and gone to McDonnell's and got a lime ricky out of the cooler and a box of Duchess potato chips. They took the pop and the box of chips to the park by the library and they were sitting on the bench. Billy's bike leaning against one of the big balsams, Dave's lying on the ground. Billy telling Dave how he was going to see his grandfather in Glace Bay, how he, how he was taking the bus by himself and how his grandfather always took him to the movies. He gets me popcorn, said Billy, and licorice. Dave said, what color? Billy said, black. And that's when Dave said, I have a fish head. (laughs) Billy said, so what? Dave said, it's mummified and deformed. (laughs) Billy said, where is it? They parked their bikes behind the ice shed. Dave said, you wait here. And he ducked alone into the damp, sawdust world of ice, and he closed the ice house door behind him because he didn't want Billy to know exactly where he kept the fish head. He took in a deep lung full of the cool, damp air, and he fetched the head from the salt barrel. But he didn't go right out. 
He kneeled by the door for a minute and made himself count it out slowly. One codhead, two codheads. He wanted Billy to think getting the head was more complicated than it was. There were wet stains on both his knees when he came out and little flecks of sawdust. They set the head on the ice sled, which was lying in the tall grass behind the shed. Sam said, why didn't you want Billy to know where it was? Dave said, because I didn't want him to be able to come and get it. It was Billy's idea to boil the meat off. (laughs) Billy said, if we boiled the meat off it, we could see the skull. So they went into the house together. Billy talked to Dave's mother while Dave scooped a handful of wooden matches from over the stove. They got an old apple juice can and they rode out to the quarry. On the way, they gathered twigs and branches and a handful of birch bark so they could build a fire. But when they got to the quarry, Dave decided he didn't want to boil the meat off. I like the way it looked, said Dave, and the way it smelled. The fish head had started to get leathery and turn a golden color. They built the fire anyway. And they poked at it with sticks for a while, and and then they threw all the wood on it to see if they could get the flames as high as their waists. Did you, said Sam? I don't remember, said Dave. (laughs) Whatever happened, they let it burn down, and when it did, they melted stuff in it. An old sneaker, (laughs) a plastic gun, Some webbing from a lawn chair. You'd never let me do that, said Sam. (laughs) And then their work was done. And they let the fire burn down, and they peed on it to make sure. (laughs) You peed on it? (laughs) Yeah, said Dave. Haven't you ever peed on a fire? (laughs) Sam said, we don't even have a quarry. Dave said, well, you should try it sometime. (laughs) Anyway, Billy came back from Glace Bay and said, my grandfather has a fish head just like yours. He he has it hanging in his boathouse. It predicts the weather. (laughs) My grandfather says it talks to him, said Billy. Dave hung his fish head from a nail at the back of his bedroom closet. (laughs) He stared at it for days, but it didn't move, and it certainly didn't say anything. Sam said, didn't it smell? Dave said, maybe a bit, but not like fish, like the sea. And then one day he came home from school and it had shifted. It wasn't looking the same way. And that night he was woken by the sound of rain on the tin roof. He got his flashlight out of his bedside table and he got out of bed and went to the cupboard and shone a light on the fish head. And he saw the head had spun completely around. Seemed like magic today. It was, in fact, the change in humidity working on the yarn. He went downstairs, the flashlight bouncing off the walls. He opened the side door and stood on the stoop. He held his hand out into the rain to be sure. When he woke up, the sun was shining and the fish head was back to normal. He told Billy on the way home from school, It works, he said. Billy said, that's what my grandfather says. <laughs> anyway, he said, Dave, that, none of that's the important part. The part I wanted to tell you about, the important part is the day I wore it to school. <laughs> but, w- w- wait a minute, wait a minute, said Sam. Did it ever work again with the rain? Dave said over and over, it was, if it was going to rain, it would shift, always like 12 hours before. All the time, said Sam. All the time, said Dave. What about snow? No, just rain. Sam said, I can't believe you never told me about this before. <laughs> Dave said, I'd forgotten all about it. Sam said, how could you forget about this? This is amazing. <laughs> and he shook his head. And then he said, okay, okay, tell me about wearing it to school. And Dave said, you're you're full of questions. Ask me questions. And Sam said, okay, how do you wear a fish head? (laughs) On your belt, said Dave. (laughs) On your belt, said Sam? Well, said Dave, on your belt loop. Next question. Why would you do that? (laughs) 
That's a good question, said Dave. I'm not sure. That was a long time ago. You have to remember, I was nine years old. You were 11, said Sam. You said you were 11. <laughs> yeah, but those were like different times. 11 then was like nine today. <laughs> he tied the fish head to his belt loop in the morning before school. Like right in front, said Sam. More to the side, said Dave. Front, side. You are so weird, said Sam. <laughs> Thank you, said Dave. <laughs> Shall I keep going? Yes, said Sam, tell me. So the fish head was tied to my belt loop with a piece of the yarn. Dave was in Miss Nicholson's class that year. And his desk was near the door. And that morning he sat at his desk with the fish head tied to his belt, just praying Miss Nicholson would ask him a question, any question, so he could stand up and answer. <laughs> and eventually she did, of course. What happened, said Sam. Well, when she noticed the fish head, she sent me to the office and the principal phoned my dad, said Dave. Your grandfather. I know, said Sam. Just what happened? It took Charlie 20 minutes to get there to the school. When he arrived, he walked into the principal's office. He said, hello, Ned. What seems to be the problem here? Dave was sitting on the chair in the corner of the office where you sat when you're in trouble. And when his father walked in, the first thing he saw was that Charlie had a fish head tied to his belt loop. <laughs> did your father really do that, said Sam? <laughs> yup, said Dave, he really did. Then what happened? I don't know, said Dave, he, he took me home, I think. Or fishing, he might have taken me fishing. You don't remember? I do remember that he put his hand on my shoulder as we walked out of the principal's office. That made me feel good. Dave and Sam were coming up on the corner of the last big hill, almost home. Neither of them said anything for a while. And then as they turned into Margaret's yard, Sam said that was a cool thing for him to do. It sounds like he was a good dad. Dave said, that's what I said. And then Dave said... I think I still have the fish head. <laughs> Sam shook his head. Sam said, so weird. <laughs> they found the fish head before they went to bed in a box at the back of Dave's old cupboard with a bunch of stuff like that, a, a little cast iron can and a set of hockey cards, some marbles. It was leathery and golden as if it had been smoked. A piece of green yarn still tied through the top. Sam was sitting on the bed holding it. He said, it doesn't smell. I thought it would smell. They were both sleeping in Dave's old bedroom. And Sam was already in his pajamas. Dave was getting ready. Sam said, can I have it? He was sitting on the bed nearest the window, turning the fish head around in his hands. Dave said, I always kind of liked that it was here. If I... Give it to you. Would you leave it here or take it home? Sam said, I'd take it home. Dave said, uh, what would you do with it? Sam said, I'd wear it to school on my belt. <laughs> like you. Dave said, why? Sam said, because. And when I have a kid, I'd give it to him and tell him the story and he'll wear it to school. And then it'll be a family tradition. I think Grandpa would like that. Dave laughed. Yes, he said, I think he would like that very much. And then he turned and stared out the bedroom window, his breath fogging the glass. With the trees still not in bud, he could see right over the house where his uncle used to live and all the way down to the roofs of the storefronts on Railroad Street. Far away, the steeple of the United Church at one end and the tallest building in town, the clock tower on the town hall at the other. All these little moments, he thought. Who knows which ones are going to count and which ones will be forgotten. It's never the things you think. It isn't the fishing trip or even the fish. It's the fish head. <laughs> it's the smoke, never the fire. And the smoke is wily and wispy and the smell of it gets in your hair and your clothes and no matter how much you try to duck around the flames... The wind always changes. It always 
gets in your eyes. What's the matter, said Sam? Are you crying? Just a little, said Dave. But it's okay. It's, it's not unhappy crying. It happens when I come here sometimes. It's like there's a big fire here for me. And sometimes when I get close to it, the smoke gets in my eyes. He turned away from the window and sat down on his old bed beside his son. Tomorrow, he said, we'll help Grandma with the garden, and then before supper, we'll go out to the graveyard, and I'll show you your grandfather's grave. Can I bring this, said Sam? He was holding the fish head. Thank you.